Our gospel lesson for today is going to be found in the book of Matthew, the second chapter, and it's the 13th through 23rd verses. It should be a familiar story to you. I decided to change things up today and read out of my old NIV Bible, which has, by the way, my Disciple One class notes in it. If you want to see what the marks of discipleship are, they're all right here. Matthew 2, 13 through 23. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up. He took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he'd stayed until the death of Herod. And so it was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he'd learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life were dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So he was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me now? Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When you go to get your driver's license, some of you are going to be old enough to do that soon. Some of them just did it. One of the tests that you must pass is a visual test to show that you know what each of the signs on the road means. There's the stop sign, the merge sign, the yield sign, the school zone, no passing zone, and of course, the speed limit sign. That's the sign I hate the most. Well, except, of course, for the detour sign. Detours, I hate them. When you're cruising along at 65 miles an hour, your favorite tunes are playing on the radio, and you're making great time, and you actually think, I'm going to make it to my destination early. And then suddenly, you see that bright orange sign that tells you that road construction's ahead. And then you see the flagman. And the road is inconveniently blocked by this construction and you're forced to take an exit and exit this beautifully built six lane highway and you're sent down a two lane road ever winding with speed limits that jump from 25 to 35 to 45 to 25 back and over and back and over for the next 25 miles. So much for being early, so much for your plans. The key to surviving a detour used to be to have a good navigator sitting in the seat beside you. In the days before GPS, kids, there were days before GPS, we used these things called maps. Don't know if you're familiar with them or not. Maybe. I'm getting some nods over there. But your navigator would pull out the map and, and tell you the quickest route around the construction and the traffic jam 
But this person needed to be able to read the signs and directions clearly on the map to lead you quickly and safely off the bumpy road and back onto the super smooth super highway. Life has many detours that can just be thrown up at you at the most inopportune of times. Not all of them are as insignificant as being directed off the interstate. Some of them are indeed life-changing, and some are even life-saving. In our lesson today, the baby Jesus and his family are headed toward one of those detours, and luckily for us, certain people were really good at reading the signs and navigating them through the danger. Truthfully, things probably weren't all that much different in Bethlehem way back then than they are for us today. The whole Christmas story was one major detour after another. Just think about it. Mary and Joseph were espoused to be married, and then wham, God throws up a detour. She's with child, and it's not Joseph's. And will deliver the Son of God on top of that. And along the way, as they're headed home to, for the census, Mary goes into labor. Rather than a comfortable room at their ancestral home, or even the nearby inn, Mary and Joseph are forced to detour into a nearby barn or cave. Shepherds are out in the field watching their flocks, doing their jobs, when suddenly, oh! An angel appears and tells them of the miracle about to happen in Bethlehem. They detour from their jobs and rush to see the miracle. And last week at this time, we eagerly awaited the long expected birth of the Messiah. We lit the Advent candles and sang the festive Christmas hymns appropriate to the season. But now gone is the peace of that Christmas Eve with our darkened rooms and lighted softly by lights on trees and strains of silent night. Gone are the presents in brightly decorated boxes, a reminder of the wise men who came seeking the child Jesus. In some homes, the Christmas tree is already gone. The lights packed up for another year. Christmas has once again come and gone, and now it's on to another new year. The manger in which the family dwelt for at least one night now stands empty, except for the animals that normally lived there. The miracle of the Savior's birth were all but forgotten as life turns back to normal for the people of Bethlehem. Jesus has left the barn and moved now into a house. He is nearer to celebrating his second birthday. Joseph, Jesus' adopted father, has probably opened his own carpentry shop, and Mary has gone about raising her firstborn son. Life has returned to normal. And though we know nothing about the intervening time between Jesus' birth and today's gospel, Matthew does fill in some of the gaps for us. Nothing seems all that spectacular. But as happens when you become involved with the Savior, things can quickly change. The family quickly receives a reminder of just how important their son is. God is about to throw up some more detour signs in their lives. In the first 12 verses of this chapter of Matthew, the gospel writer tells us the story of the three stargazing wise men who followed the star to Jerusalem seeking Jesus. Now these men had studied the scriptures and ancient prophecies and therefore understood well the significance of the star that they followed. They had been left a road map of sorts and they were following it. This, this star, they believe, signaled the birth of a long-awaited Messiah and it spoke perfectly in harmony with the words of Micah's pronouncement that said, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. That's Micah 5, 2. Along their way to Jesus, however, the wise men decide to stop off at Herod's palace. They made this slight detour to get a better fix on where the baby Jesus 
may be laying his head. Now, women, I know what you're thinking. These must really be wise men. Because how many of your husbands actually stop and ask for directions? Herod was clueless about his child, this child named Jesus. And he was dumbfounded to find out that a new king had come to his little corner of the world, hiding his fear of the threat another king posed to him. Herod sent the wise men to find Jesus, and when they found him, they were to return to him with the news. He did all of this under the pretense that he wanted to go and worship the Christ child. But the true intent, however, was that Herod was going to go back later and kill Jesus. Returning to that giant, bright, God-style GPS in the sky, the wise men were guided, we are told in Matthew, to the house in which Jesus and his family now reside. After laying the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh at his feet in tribute to their king, they turned to leave and head back to Herod. But God threw up another divine roadblock. They were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, for his murderous plan was unfolding. So instead of returning to Jerusalem and Herod's castle, they changed and returned home by another route. I'm not sure what Mary and Joseph were thinking after the wise men left. I'm sure they felt honored and confused. Maybe Joseph thought he'd use some of the gold to invest in his business. But whatever their plans were, God had a different plan in mind for them. Another detour. Matthew tells us next that Joseph is visited by the angel of the Lord for the second time, who tells him to get up and take his child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until the threat passes. Joseph got up immediately, took the child and his mother by night, and fled to Egypt. Now, if if the wise men would have stayed around, they would have told Jesus that this too was prophesied to occur. Matthew 2.15 quotes Hosea 11. And now receive this blessing. Go forth in peace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.